So, my title today is How Not to Become More Godly. There's a title for you, yeah? You're glad you came. How Not to Become More Godly. So, and as you can see by my physique, I am in good shape. Round to be precise, and I know I need to lose some weight. And I have tried over the years, and I know I need to try again. Anyway, moving on. I did some research on diets, and I discovered that there are five diets supported by science. They are the low-carb whole food diet, the Mediterranean diet, the Paleo diet, which is currently the world's most popular diet. Apparently, it looks for foods that we ate around in the Stone Age. Remind me a bit off. <laughs> um, there's back to Sheena, you got that joke. It's terrible, I know, but you got it. <laughs> there's a vegan diet, and that's obviously become very popular over the last decade. And of course, there is the gluten free diet, which of course is absolutely essential for those who are intolerant to gluten. And there's also a number of so called fad diets to help you lose weight quickly. There's the Atkins diet. There is the Zoan diet, there is the Dukin diet, and there is the 5 2 diet, to name but a few. And research shows that while fad diets are really good for helping lose weight quickly, they're not very good for long term sustainability. Different diets work for different people. And often we get with the question how can I get more healthy? And when you look at diets, the first thing you look at, well at least I do anyway, is what am I not allowed to eat and drink? What are the do nots? Do not eat crisps from Do not eat chocolate bars. Maybe start to get a bit demoralised because all the fun of eating was out. But the first thing you look at sometimes is what are the do nots? What are the things that we have to cut out of our diet? to stop putting it into our body so that our weight decreases and our health increases because that's really the purpose of diets. Now, at the beginning of diets, we're all very good, we're all very disciplined, but then life happens and you end up, before you know it, as I have found many times, that the do-nots seem to eventually come the do's. And before you know it, you don't really care about the do-nots anymore. Anyone identify with that? Or am I the only one? You're the only one. Oh, it's <laughs> Fantastic. Anyway. But I wonder, have we ever asked the question, not how can I get more healthy, but how can I get more godly? What are the things that I need to stop doing in order to become a better follower of Jesus. To be more spirit-led than always failing because I keep doing what I wish I would stop doing. If I could just stop doing such and such, then maybe things would be so much better. I would feel more godly. Anyone ask that kind of question? Or again, is it just me? Is it just me? <laughs> well, I know I've asked that question. And ever since Adam and Eve sinned, one of the biggest challenges towards becoming more godly is the problem of how do we keep those sinful desires that we all have under control? Whether you call it flesh or the old nature 
or indwelling sin, we all wrestle with strong internal temptations to do wrong. So the very practical question is, how can we stop doing what we know we ought not to do? It was a very real question for the Colossian believers, and it's a very real question for us today. So what advice does Paul give? Well, let's look at our passage for today, and we're in Colossians again, and this time we're in chapter 2, and we're going to finish off chapter 2 today. Woo! We made it, we made it to the end of chapter 2, we're halfway through, because yeah. <laughs> there's four chapters in Colossians. <laughs> we're almost halfway through, um, so we're looking at verses 20 to 23, and it says this, Since you died with Christ to the eternal elemental spiritual forces of this world, why? As though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have to do with the things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Paul is giving us another warning. Now he started giving us warnings, he introduced them in verse 8 of chapter 2, where he said, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human traditions and the elemental spiritual forces of this world, rather than on Christ. He went then on to explain some of these benefits of what it means to know Christ, and therefore argued, why would you want to depart from that? Why would you want to embrace hollow and deceptive philosophy when we have all these benefits of knowing Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Why would you want to trans take that away and pursue hollow and deceptive philosophy? However, Paul recognised that there were people out there who wanted to take to, to, allow, to, to, to get us to do that, to take us away. And follow that hollow and deceptive philosophy, in effect, taking us captive. And some of the warnings to us are so that we are aware of what we are to be on the lookout for, so that we do not fall into that trap. And the first warning was found in verses 16 and 17, where Paul warned us against people who would want to judge us wrongly. He essentially warned against being subjected to legalism. And then in verse 18, we found the second one where Paul warned us against people who would want to disqualify us, essentially warning against those, uh, warning against being subjected to mysticism. Paul is warning us that when we shift our concentration away from the central message of the gospel, which is Christ and all that he achieved in his death, burial, and resurrection, then legalism and mysticism can slowly and subtly twist our thinking until our lives and actions are driven more by our opinions and the opinions of other people rather than on the cause of Christ. And so the third warning, which we're looking at today, kind of builds on those previous two warnings, but adds something else. So another reason, most commentators call it asceticism. Oh, that's an awfully big word. And what does that actually mean? Well, according to the Oxford American Dictionary, that is defined as characterised by severe self-discipline and abstention from all forms of indulgence, typically for religious reasons. In simpler terms, asceticism is a belief that if you add up enough physical negatives, you will achieve a spiritual positive. Mere avoidance becomes the path to holiness. That's what asceticism basically is. In other words, if you embrace the do-nots of life, like a diet, if you embrace the do-nots of life, 
and uh, avoid sinful behavior, then you will become more godly. And you can see there is something, there is a logic to that. And over the centuries, this has been expressed or taken to extreme in different ways. The creation of monasteries uh, where vows were taken to separate themselves from the world um, in order to try and keep sin out. Some have used castration, some have taken vows of celibacy, some have used disciplinary and devotional practices of flogging yourself in order with whips or other instruments as a, some sort of form of penance to share in the sufferings of Jesus in order to put our focus back to God. Now we tend to think of that behaviour as rather extreme and things of the past. But as recent as 1988, the Christianity Today published an editorial calling for a return to monastism in the church. Granted, they weren't calling for hair shirts, or sleeping on hard floors, or living on top of pillars, but they did call for vows of celibacy and poverty. And let's face it, not all asceticism is bad. Many in the church could do with a little self-discipline and a little self-restraint. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 9, referred to godly asceticism when he spoke of buffeting his body and making it his slave preparatory to running a race so that he could win. Paul also instructed Timothy to endure hardship as a good soldier of Christ Jesus and to discipline himself for the purpose of godliness. Self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. Jesus himself said in Luke 9, 23, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow me. And it seems that self-denial Self-discipline is an essential part of following Jesus. So what is Paul warning us of here in these verses? Well, Paul has in mind the people who would impose man-made rules concerning the body and one's behaviour as, as a means of enhancing one's relationship to God. He has in mind those people who would view the body as something to be punished, something to be denied. It is literally for them the flesh. They would say that the body is regarded as evil and the only way to defeat it is to starve it of anything that might spark desire. This is not an easy subject to preach, but when you preach through the scriptures, You've got to deal with what's in front of you and what's next. And this is what's next. As I said before, Paul has in mind those who would have the belief that if you add up enough physical negatives, you'll gain a spiritual positive. He has in mind those who believe that mere avoidance is the path to holiness. Paul's point here that he's trying to say to the Christian believers is at the start of verse 20, is that since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, then that means we should be dead to all that stuff. We no longer belong to the world's <coughs> rules. We belong to Christ and the rules of the kingdom. Therefore, we ought to be dead to all that stuff that the world would seek to impose on us. And man will seek to impose on us because we were bracing what God imposes on us. Do you see the difference that we're trying to highlight here? The key defense for the Christian against such error is, as we explained last week, is to hold fast to Christ. To hold on to Christ. <coughs> because we have died with Christ to the elemental spirits reigning over this world with their various rules and ordinances. Paul's response to the legalistic approach, the mystical approach, the ascetic approach to Christian living 
is unmerciful. And he faults it on four points. The first point, he says, is that all such things perish as they are used. Colossians 2.21 says, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, probably citing who you were speaking against, mocking them maybe with their own words. The things included in their list of taboos are perishable objects of this material world destined to dissipate even as they are used. But his main point is that these sorts of rules cannot deal with the problem that we all wrestle with, namely sinful desires in our hearts. All it does is lead to a restrictive, repressive kind of life. Now we can all keep the rules, but our hearts can be far from God. This is what Jesus spoke of concerning the Pharisees in Matthew 5, 18, when he says, these people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. The Pharisees had over 600 <coughs> rules to God's command to keep the Sabbath holy. 600 rules of probably a bunch of do nots. Probably the majority would do not do this, do not do that, do not do the next thing, do not do that, do not, you can't do that, you're not allowed to do it, you're not allowed to speak that, you're not allowed to wear that. So many rules interpreting keep the Sabbath day holy. And of course, we know from when Jesus spoke and did things on the Sabbath, he was telling them, you know, that's not what the Sabbath is for. The Sabbath is for God, not for man's rules. And it's a sad state of affairs when people look at Christians and they're prevented from coming to Christ because all they see is a list of do-nots. All they see is the things that they're not allowed to do anymore. And yes, when coming to Christ, change is necessary. Behaviours do need to change, but we all know that it's not rules that change us. It's Christ, by His Spirit in us, that changes us. It's not man-made rules that change us. It's Christ that changes us by His Spirit. So the second fault Paul highlights to his legalistic, mystical, ascetic approach to Christian life is such rules are man-made and they're not divinely given. Paul says they are according to human precepts and teachings. The essence of legalism is the demand for others to conform to your conscience when God has remained silent or has not been absolute. These man-made rules can come from people deciding stuff to try and keep some level of control. Or it can be from someone that says, I have a dream, I have a dream. And as we said previously, when that happens, we can't just follow it blindly. We have to test it to make sure that it has actually come from God. And if it has come from God, then we obey it. Too often we hear preach from the pulpit the opinion of a person rather than just speaking what the Bible says. From my own point of view, I try to articulate what the Bible is saying and not give my own opinions. But I recognize that I am a fallen human being. And so I trust and pray that you're all like the Bereans, who were of more character than the Thessalonians. And that when you go home, you will go home and you will study the scriptures for yourself to see if what Robbie is saying is true. <laughs> because, yes, I can get it wrong. I can put something across in a way that maybe is mis misunderstood or misinterpreted. But we always have to go back to what God says. And that is found in the Word of God. Don't just take my word for it. Go and study it for yourselves. <laughs> Because it's so easy to take what is said from the pulpit or a YouTube channel or a book and automatically agree with it. Let me give you an example. Someone preaches from Ephesians 5.18 that says, do not get drunk with wine and immediately says it's wrong for Christians to drink alcohol. Avoidance is the key to not becoming drunk. And there is some wisdom in that. But it's also taking the verse out of context from the whole message of the Bible. 
Now, I'm not saying if it's right or wrong, that's for your own conscience to decide, because you have to do that, deal with that before God. So I'm not going to give you my opinion on this. All I'm going to say is why would Jesus turn water into wine? Why would yeah, you know, Paul say to Timothy, stop drinking only water, but use a little wine because of your stomach and your frequent, frequent illnesses? There's always a balance. There's always a matter of conscience about whether for us it is okay to drink alcohol or not based on what God tells us, not what man tells us. And we also have to be aware of the respect we have for other believers. It's, it's unwise to openly drink in front of someone that is recovering from alcoholism. There's wisdom. There always has to be wisdom and the sensitivity of the Holy Spirit when we're dealing in these great areas where God doesn't say yes, He doesn't say no. But we can't just take a simple illustration. You can just see how easy it is for that illustration, for, for someone, for a man, to take what God has said in the Bible and use that to then add on to it a man-made command where God hasn't actually said <coughs> That's what we're kind of talking about here. You can apply that to lots and lots of different things. But that's the easiest example to kind of illustrate. And the third fault is that this legalistic, mystical, ascetic approach to spiritual living only seems to be wise. It follows on from what we've just said. It says Paul, these have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and false humility and severity to the body. This emphasizes the point that it's so easy for us to hear something, to read something that appears to be wise, but we need to test it, we need to balance it against what God has revealed in his own words. We have to make sure that we read verses in the context of what God is saying as a revelation from justice to revelation. But that phrase, severity to the body, struck me is not only denying our physical bodies as something we may need, but it also speaks of severity to the body of Christ. How often do these promotions of self-made religion are used to speak harshly to those in the body of Christ who do not follow those practices? It goes back to not letting anyone judge us wrongly and only emphasizes that when we allow these self-made and man-made religious practices become more important to us, that the cause of Christ then we so disunity, we so fragmentation, because we then go into this group that believes that, and this group that believes this, and the body suffers. That's why Ephesians 4 he says, make every effort to keep the unity of peace through, well, keep the unity of the Spirit, sorry, through the bond of peace. And then fourth thought, and it's perhaps Paul's most important statement. Notwithstanding the spiritual surface that such spiritual activities produce, they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Rules and prohibitions and self-denial that spring from man's own religion and creativity are utterly ineffective in curbing spiritual uh, the desires of the flesh. Paul says that in of itself, this asceticism won't help us keep in check spiritual urgings and it will not energize us in the war against temptation. The sort of rule keeping approach to Christian life only feeds to serve the flesh because it doesn't deal with our pride. Pretty soon, those who keep the rules begin to look down on those who don't keep the rules. And if we fall into this trap, then pretty soon we're going to be thinking like the Pharisee in Luke 18, 11 and 12. It says, God, I thank you that I am not like other people. Swindlers, unjust, even a tax collector. I fast twice a week and I pay all the tithes that I get. The story shows that we can take good things and become proud for doing them. And it's right not to be a swindler. It's right not to be unjust. It's right uh, that you fast for the right reasons. It's right that you use good stewardship. It's right that you read God's word. It's right to pray. It's right 
to come to worship services with other believers, but when we start boasting even to ourselves about our performance, then we're acting in the flesh, and the flesh never produces godliness. So in conclusion, the question must be asked, what will? Surely Paul will do more than merely denounce what is ineffective. Surely he will offer an alternative. Well, of course he does. But unfortunately, the division between chapter 2 and chapter 3 <laughs> obscures the point. <laughs> Paul didn't put it there. Man put it there. <laughs> but it's one passage. It's one flow. Paul indeed does have a remedy for fleshly indulgence, a remarkably simple one, found in the first two verses of chapter 3. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. To become more godly, more holy. In, in this case, the ability to say no to fleshly indulgence comes not from <coughs> rigorous asceticism or self-restraint, but from a mind that is captivated, controlled with the beauty and the majesty of the risen Christ and all that we are in Him in the heavenless. Yes. We'll maybe talk about that next week. <laughs> Paul's answer is to look to Christ. Colossians 2.20, since you died with Christ, to the elemental spiritual forces of this world. Colossians 2, 1, 3, 1 says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. The way to become more godly is through applying the truth of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection to our lives. So when we read things like when Jesus says, If you want to be my disciple, then deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me, is in the context of, of denying yourself in order to follow Christ. Because you're following Christ, you're pursuing Christ. The fruit of the Spirit, self-control, it comes from the Spirit of God which wants to give honour and praise to Jesus. It's all about Christ. Set your mind on things above, not on everything. Set your heart on things above. Your heart and your mind on Christ. That's how we can become more godly, not through a bunch of rules that man has made as some sort of checklist to holiness. If you don't do this, if you don't do that, if you don't do this, if you don't do the next thing, then you'll be more holy. That's not the way to become more godly, is to pursue Christ. Let's just bow our heads for a moment, shall we? This is a difficult subject to deal with, but as we come before Jesus, maybe some of us need to take a moment because we've allowed legality to come into our lives. Maybe we've been following rules given to us by another person rather than seeing if that's something that God actually wants us to. Maybe we've been proud of our rule keeping and how good we are at our disciplines. <coughs> Maybe we're living our lives more out of religion rather than relationship to Jesus. Let's just take some time just to ask for forgiveness, to come before Christ once again come to the cross where mercy reigns. Father, forgive us for when we have followed the rules of man. Lord, we confess that we have maybe gone adrift. 
But Lord, we want to recenter ourselves on Christ, on his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Because as Galatians 5 1 says, it was for freedom that Christ has set us free to stand firm in them and do not let ourselves be enslaved <coughs> again by a yoke of slavery. Father, we want to be changed by you. We don't want to be changed by rules. We want to be changed by your spirit that is at work and alive in us. As Paul says, brothers and sisters, we have been called to be free. But we don't want to use our freedom to indulge the flesh. But we want to do it to serve one humbly in love. Thank you, Lord, for your death, your burial, and your resurrection. But that centers us on you. Father, help us to set our hearts on things above to where Christ is. Help us set our minds on things above, not on earthly things. May we never boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is the new creation. Father, help me, help us to live in the beauty of your new creation, of what you have done for us. To live according to your ways, to your rules.